Justin Moyers, and I'm one of the medical oncologists at University of California, Irvine. Um, so I was going to talk today about um, precision oncology, you know, and melanoma. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is today is actually World Cancer Day on February 4th, and so um, I guess this was developed about in 2000, um, just kind of to um, you know recognize research and you know aware, raise awareness for cancers and you know one of the um, uh, in, in melanoma, many of the treatments for the immunotherapy and target therapies have, you know, translated into successes in other cancers. And so that's, you know, kind of one of the things to think about too. Um, so outline brief, what we're going to discuss today. Um, I'll, I'll have a brief caveat and then discuss what is precision oncology. And then um, kind of as a practical example, I invented a fake NGS and we were just going to go over those results and, you know, the potential options that people would have, you know, based on that. And so the caveat, and somebody might discuss this later today, um, this dream seek trial um, for, for, so for people with um, you know, metastatic melanoma, immunotherapy should be probably given to all patients first as long as they don't have a reason not to, because you know they, they do better um, on average if you give immunotherapy first. So that's just the caveat. Um, and how do we define precision oncology? So the definition I, used, I like to use best, um, this one borrowed from Sabayan Kurzrock about um, the right drug for the right patient, or sorry, the right drug at the right time for the right patient is kind of the goal. Um, and, you know, how is this done? So the traditional way is that you look at the tumors based on what tumor type they have um, by the side of the tumor. And the goal, precision oncology, is not only to recognize um, the side of the primary tumor, but also look at the genetic information um, and use those to develop and um, place people that may work for them. Um, I borrowed some of these slides from one of my mentors, Dr. Merrick at Anderson. So I forgot to give credit to her on those, but um, the, um, and, and the NCI, um, but what are we looking for? So the things we're looking for are things called oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. Um, and these oncogenes are things that um, when they're turned on, they can lead to cancer growth. Um, tumor suppressors, um, whereas they are different when they have an alteration, it cuts the brakes of the tumor suppressor essentially. And so growth is no longer re regulated. So these tumors can grow um, kind of out of control. And what we're looking for is in this, keeping this car analogy, you know, drivers versus passengers. The ones that matter are these driver mutations. They're the ones that are causing the tumors to grow um, and activating mutations in the oncogenes um, are the ones we're looking for or inactivating alterations in tumor suppressor genes. Um, and so then going on next to next generation sequencing the DNA. So how does this work? So commonly what will happen is this next generation sequencing also called NGS um, is done by several companies um, and many academic institutions have their own proprietary processing. And so they take the tumor, they process it into its DNA fragments, they analyze it and they give out a report and that report may give some options for um, some potential therapies or kind of tell you some prognostic information if, if therapies are going to work or not. Um, and so this is this NGS that I made up. And so I'll kind of go over this. Um, this is not any specific patient information or anything, just as that caveat as well. Um, so the first thing we look at are these genomic variants. What are they? So they're usually a change in one of the base pairs um, in DNA that causes a change in the amino acid and, the, and how the protein works. Um, the next thing we look at, uh, although uncommon, are these fusions and copy number um, alterations. I should say alterations. Um, and how does that work? Specific genes have number of copies. The more number of copies of a gene, the more proteins made. And so we look at some of these copy number alterations as well. Um, the fusion um, picture, I think, got lost accidentally. But those are um, things where specific portions of the genes are um, interposed into places where they shouldn't be. Um, and then lastly, there's the, the immunotherapy markers, which we'll talk about more in a second. Um, so in melanoma, the traditional things that we think about are in this kind of picture graph where we have all these little um, proteins that are being made and turn on and off each other. And so the big ones that we know of are the ones in the blue that um, are the BRAF, MEC, and RAS that I'll talk about more in a second. Um, and then there's a couple other ones at play. Um, including this P10, PI3K, AKT, and then um, in uveal melanomas, this GNAC. Um, about half of those have that, and about 15% of melanomas has NF1. And so we'll talk about, these are the ones we're going to talk about. Um, so we'll go from there. Um, 
First, for classes of graph alterations, um, there's three different classes. Um, the, one, the one that's most relevant is the class one alterations that include the V600. So this is the one we typically think about for people who get um, BRAF treatments. Um, these are the ones where the treatments work for, for sure. And so we get those a green light. Um, the next ones are the atypical, they're class two or class three. The class two um, have non-V600 mutations and they still have their protein working, their kinase is activated. So the protein's still working somewhat um, and they form these BRAF dimers. So two of these BRAF proteins come together and we give those a yellow light because sometimes the treatments work, sometimes they don't. And I'll show that in a second. And the class three, these are the ones where those treatments that we have so far don't seem to work. Um, and so they are also not V600 and they have a whole host of different um, changes. And so these are kind of the three ones that we think about class one are definitely a go, class two, sometimes go, class three, probably not gonna work. Um, and so looking at this NGS that we made up, so this NGS, the, the tumor has a BRAF V600 E mutation, which is the class one one. And so um, we know that from these trials um, that most people's tumors will respond. They'll shrink with this treatment, but the tumor response isn't usually long-term, but there are some people who have this very long um, good response. So this is the Kaplan-Meier curve like Dr. Sai um, just um, explained. And we know that at five years, there's still 30 for five, around 30% or a third of people who, um, who had a good response to these drugs that you know, have probably a long-term remission. Um, and then even better, if you look at the people who had um, this kind of pooled analysis of what their best response was. So the, in green is the people who had a complete response. And those are the people who tend to do the best. They're ones who have their tumor completely shrink down to nothing on the CT scans. And you know, at five years, if that happened, the majority of them are you know, still um, you know, doing well with their melanoma. Um, and so this is with dibrafenib and uh, uh, trametinib. Um, when you look at, um, there's three different combinations usually used. Incrafenib and benimetinib is another combination, um, same good results. Um, and then the other thing we think about is brain metastases. So we know that immunotherapy works for brain metastases, but also these pills do. And so this is one of the um, you know, major studies where they called combi MB. They use the dibrafenib and trametinib, and you know it, it works and shrinks brain tumors, but um, you know not usually for a substantial amount of time. Um, next, we're going on to the atypical or the class two mutations, um, and so these class two mutations, um, which sometimes people will get on their NGS, um, they work or they respond to treatment with trametinib and uh, dibrafenib and trametinib as well. Um, in, in this study, uh, published in the JCO several years ago, um, seven out of the 38 patients had tumor shrinkage while they were on these um, treatments. So not nearly as good as the V600, but still, you know, there's some people who have tumor shrinkage responses. And this Kaplan-Meier curve shows that same thing. Um, and then one of the other things we always like to point out is, you know, there's, like I said, there's three different combinations of these BRAF and MEK pills. And they each have different side effects. So it's kind of a, um, you choose one, start with one. And if you have the side effect, you can always go to a different one. And so um, what this chart shows I really like is um, the pink is the dibrafenib and trametinib. The well, no, maroon is um, vimerafenib and covimetinib. And the orange is incrafenib and binimetinib. And so you see that you know, people who have lots of fever with the dibrafenib and trametinib, but less so with uh, incrafenib and binimetinib. Um, people have less joint pains with the vimerafenib and covimetinib, but um, sorry, more than the other two drugs is what I meant to say. Um, and so you can kind of pick and choose which side effects you have. If you have a side effect, you can always switch to one of the others. Um, and then what do we have Mo oh, moving past graph? So um, the first thing we th think of, um, this was kind of published in the pre-checkpoint um, pre time is that um, kid alterations, which are seen in about 10% of melanomas, more often in acral and mucosal. So um, the melanomas like in the nose, throat, or feet. Um, and in a study from that, 
about 10 of 43 patients or 23% um, had a partial response. So they had a tumor shrinkage while they were on this imatinib, this kit inhibitor. Um, and then to give a plug to Dr. Sai, um, she has this trial that's um, enrolling patients um, for this kit mutant melanoma um, that's hopefully going to expand to more of these consortium sites. Um, NF1 is another alteration we can see sometimes on the NGS. And this sometimes tells us that people um, have had their melanoma mostly from UV damage, sun, um, and that they may respond to upfront immunotherapy better than other patients that don't have this NF1 mutation. So that's, that's kind of a good marker. Um, the next marker we think of is this NRAS. Um, NRAS um, targeted therapy with benimetinib um, was, was shown after the NEMO trial. And this NEMO trial, they gave um, either decarbazine, which is a systemic chemotherapy, a toxic chemo chemotherapy versus benimetinib after pe people's tumors grew on immunotherapy. And they found that benimetinib does better than chemotherapy. Um, so that's you know, another option after immunotherapy isn't working any longer. That's actually the same thing. Um, and then the other thing we think about when we look at the NGS is the tumor mutational burden and how that's measured is um, the number of mutations per every million um, bases in the DNA. And so we think that above 10 is probably high, maybe in melanoma, the cut point should be a little bit higher. Um, but there's uh, FDA approval for immunotherapy for any types of tumors that have a tumor mutational burden greater than 10. So this 30 you know, puts them in the 90th percentile and you know, it's a high number. Um, what is tumor mutational burden? So why, and why do we think it works with immunotherapy? Um, tumors that have high mutational burdens, they are making their DNA quite messily and that can cause to increase T cells to react to it um, and cause the tumor response. Um, and then this also just shows how high melanoma's tumor mutational burden is, is that um, it's up there where I put the yellow star, higher than pretty much all the other cancers except for a couple of subsets of um, colorectal and um, squamous cell cancers actually have a higher. Um, and so those are the, alter or the um, genomic alterations I was gonna talk about. The next thing is you know, kind of a rare subset of these fusions in melanoma. Um, so fusions are not common in melanoma, uh, but there's several drugs now that have a tumor agnostic. So whatever tumor you have, you can use these um, drugs approval in um, that we're going to talk about. So in this um, data from the AECR genie that pulled um, uh, of the people of the tumors, about 700 tumors that had um, their 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 tumor DNA tested, you know, almost 10% had a um, fusion. So about 9% had a fusion that they could potentially get a treatment for. So the most common one is the BRAF fusion. So just like the other alterations, you can get a BRAF fusion, put two different types, two different proteins together to make this fusion product. Um, and these BRAF fusion products um, have a dimerization domain that, um, that does activate that whole pathway. So it still causes that pathway to grow and causes the melanoma to grow. Um, there's some case reports. So case reports are kind of the lowest level of evidence, just one or two patients, where we use these MEK inhibitors um, to, to shrink the tumors. And in this specific case report, um, this uh, BRAF fusion, given trametinib, had um, tumor that shrunk for several months. Um, another recent approval, um, this is FDA approved for any patient who has a TREC fusion, is these Intrex drugs. So larotrectinib is an intrec inhibitor, um, and it was done in the study of phase one, phase two study of all tumor types. Um, and in that first study, two of the patients had melanoma. And if you see that green line, the further down it goes, the better the tumor shrank. And one of the people had a 100% response, another had 70% response of their tumor shrinking from the baseline. Um, and so these are drugs that if the, if the patient has the one, the one and a half percent of patients have intrac fusions and melanoma, if, if you're one of those ones, and you can possibly try this drug. Um, there's also a separate intrac inhibitor called intrectinib um, that's also approved for that same reason, but that trial didn't include any melanoma patients. So that's why I, I show the layer of trectinib data. Um, ROS1 fusion. So this is a common fusion in lung cancers, um, and it's not common in melanoma, except for a specific subtype of melanoma called Spitz melanomas. 
Um, and it's present in about 9% of those. Um, it still activates that same pathway that all these BRAF drugs are um, acting against. Um, and you can use a drug called Crizotinib, which is a ROS1 inhibitor, or even that um, prior intract uh, intractinib as well. Um, and um, this is an example of a person's PET scan. It's all those black dots in kind of the upper torso um, and lower torso, and those lymph nodes are lymph nodes that the cancer is in, and those went away after somebody was on a Crizotinib um, um, inhibitor. Sorry, that should say, yeah, ROS1, not, not MEK inhibitor. Sorry about that. Um, and so that's another option. Again, case report levels, the lowest level of evidence, um, but still kind of an option if there's not better options. Um, and then another thing that's coming out um, is pralcetinib. Um, there's another RET inhibitor as well, but these are RET fusions as well. Um, not very common in melanoma, but there's been, you know, there's a couple cases of it. So that's another thing you can consider. So that's kind of the overview I have today of the, um, the targeted therapies you can consider. Um, but why doesn't it always work? So this is a good picture of, you know, why do these targeted therapies don't work? A couple reasons. Um, tumors are not homogenous. They're not all the same everywhere. So some tumors have different mutations within even the same tumor. And so it might kill part of the tumor, but allow the other part to grow. And so this is why we're always... Um, trying to think of new drugs and new combinations for people who have tumors that don't respond to the traditional treatments. Um, and so that's, with that, I'll end it um, on this sunset. Okay, thank you. <laughs>